Hey, what's up, guys? You're now listening to Devo with Uncle Theo. Today is day 226, and we're in a new book. We're in the book of Jeremiah, and today we're going to cover chapters 1 through 3. How many of you are familiar with the passage Jeremiah 29, 11? For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. That's in this book, but there is a catch. If you made this your memory verse and you've been trusting in this verse from this book, I want you to reorient your thinking and make sure you're trusting in this verse the right way. Remind me, I don't know how you could do that since I'm engaging in monologue, but remind me not to fast forward over that verse when we get there and to cover it well, because you have to think about this verse is being quoted in the middle of Israel going into the exile. So how can God make statements about something like this when he's taking them into judgment? We'll try to unfold that when we get there. But I've given you half the battle by telling you about the captivity. Now we've talked about the Southern captivity. We talked about it happening in three waves. In 605 BC, 597 BC, and 586 BC. We saw that Isaiah, we saw in Isaiah that they were on the heels of the Assyrian exile in 722. And while that was happening, Isaiah was saying, Look, I know Assyria are the big bad players right now, but look out for who? Babylon. That's right. Well, we're here now, and Jeremiah is raised up during the last wave of the largest exile when Israel fully collapsed. Now, remember our cheat code to understanding the timeline of the prophets. We've got our timeline in the historical books, in Kings and Chronicles. But how do we know where to go back in the Kings and Chronicles to place these prophets? Well, remember, usually your first verse is always your cheat code. Let's read that. Now, the words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests who were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Amnon, king of Judah, in the 13th year of his reign. It came in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah king of Judah until the end of the 11th year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the exile of Jerusalem in the fifth month. And so we get the span here of the last few kings of Israel. So this lets us know that Jeremiah's ministry spans at least five decades across multiple different kings. And remember, what helped you with that is verse one. And so that's always how you tie your prophets to the historical narrative. Now we get a little more background about Jeremiah in verses five through nine. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, alas, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak because I am a youth. Mark that down. This is a key point. Jeremiah is young. He's estimated to be between 20 to 25 years old. Some people get more exact and say 21 years old. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am a youth, because everywhere I send you, you shall go, and all that I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord stretched out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. And so God has raised Jeremiah up for this very specific task. And this is why he's called the weeping prophet. And some take it even as far as saying Jeremiah is not only speaking God's words, he's weeping God's tears. So he has the tears of the Lord as well. Now, listen, Jeremiah is going to have a rough life, but God has empowered him to suffer. Think about that. He was ordained by God to suffer. And he was empowered by God to get through it. What if God is purposed in your life to do that? Would you accept that lot? Most people wouldn't. They would pray that suffering away every day of their life. I don't care if it was 60 years. They'll pray it to go away for 60 years, hoping that it will go away. Instead of leaning into it and receiving the power that God has ordained them with and given them to get through it. And so I want you all to have a healthy relationship with suffering. If God has ordained it for you, don't buck against it. Don't push back against it and don't try to pray it away. It's only going to make for a miserable life. And now I'm not picking on all suffering. Some suffering is meant to be prayed away. But we tend to pray every last trial and suffering that comes into our life away. Even the ones that are ordained by God. And those are the ones we feel the most miserable about because we're praying away something that God does not want for us. Now, in the first 23 chapters of Jeremiah, God is showing us the necessity of judgment. Remember, just like Isaiah, God saying, look, Israel, you must be judged, but I have a plan of salvation. So we get the outline in Jeremiah. 
1, 9 and 10. Listen to this. Then the Lord stretched out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have appointed you to this day over the nations and over the kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. Now, this is the purpose and the outline of the book, to pluck up and to overthrow, to build and to plant. Now, watch out for these phrases repeated over and over. He will tear down nations and he rebuilds them. God goes into giving analogies of judgment because of Israel's sinfulness. This is why you'll get a lot of figures of speech. For instance, one in verse 11, the almond rod is about to blossom. That's another way of saying judgment is coming. Verse 13, the boiling pot is coming from the north. This judgment is about to come. Verse 16, I will pronounce judgment on my people. Let's read that one. I will pronounce my judgments on them concerning all their wickedness, whereabout they have forsaken me and have offered sacrifices to other gods and have worshipped the works of their own hand. That's our problem. And because of that, God is about to pluck up and break down. He's about to destroy and to overthrow. And he's about to build, to plant. That moves us into chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. God is highlighting his faithfulness and saying, what have I done wrong to you, Israel? And he goes into rhetoric here. He says, is it because I delivered you from Egypt? Was that so bad? You see what God is doing? He's showing that he's absolutely blameless and that this is all Israel's fault. And their sin is twofold. In chapter 2, verse 11, he gives us the problem. He says, has a nation changed gods when there were not gods? What is he saying here? He says, look, most nations are polytheistic. They'll add another God to their pantheon. They'll take another one. Hey, what does that God do? Oh, he makes it rain. Bring him in. We need some rain. What does that God do? Oh, he's a God of fertility. A lot of our women are barren. We need that God. And see, what people do is they add gods, but they don't take them away. And this is God's argument. Why did you abandon me, Israel? You did me worse than other nations do their gods. No nation abandons their gods. But not only that, you've committed two evils against me. Verse 13, you have forsaken me. That's the first evil, the fountain of living water. And two, you've hewn out for yourselves cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. And God is the fountain of living water. Those that come to him will never thirst. But they've traded him for a cistern that cannot even hold water. And if you know something about cisterns, those cisterns that can't hold water end up developing gunk at the bottom of it, a bunch of slime and bacteria and nasty stuff. And that's what God is trying to picture for Israel. This is what you've changed me out for, that goo, that gunk. This is what you've chosen over me. So in verses 14 to 28, Israel says, how are we supposed to know that this was wrong? What do they do? Just like we do. You get pulled over by a police. What do you try to claim? You try to claim ignorance, which is why the law has embedded in it that ignorance is no excuse from the law. And this is the same thing that Israel tries to do. They try to claim ignorance. But we know ourselves that ignorance is no excuse of the law. And in verses 29 through 32, God goes on to say, do you really think you can claim ignorance? Israel, your sin is obvious. Verse 32, listen to what he says. How does a young woman forget her jewelry or bride her wedding garments? Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. How skilled are you at pursuing love? Even the worst of women can learn from your ways. On your clothes is found the lifeblood of the innocent poor. Though you did not catch them breaking in, yet in spite of all of this, you say I am innocent. He is angry with me, but I will pass judgment on you because you say I have not sinned. Why do you go about so much changing your ways? You hear that? Israel saying, what have we done? How have we sinned against God? And God is using another analogy to pin them down, saying, listen, even the worst of women, even prostitutes can learn from your ways. They're so vile. They're so wicked and disgusting. And God is cornering Israel to say, listen, you prepare for what you love. If a bride is pursuing a groom, she's prepared all her life for this day. And you're claiming ignorance. You didn't prepare for me, your groom. You didn't show me you love me. And this teaches us the lesson that you prepare for what you love. You make plans for what you love. How can you say you love God, but you won't make plans to be with him in the morning? How can you say you love God and you won't make plans to spend time with him and end your day with him? This is the fruit of showing that our love is deficient. And this isn't meant to beat you up. This is meant to tell you reality and that tweaks and adjustments need to be made because in your heart, 
that if you really desire something and if you really love something, you will make plans. And that moves us into chapter three, verses one through five. God says to Israel, you have committed such infidelity. Is it not right for one to have a divorce? And what God is speaking here, he says, God says, if a husband divorces his wife and she goes from him and belongs to another man, will he still return to her? Will not the land be completely polluted? But you are a harlot with many lovers. Yet you turn to me, declares the Lord. Lift up your eyes. So you hear Israel's faithlessness, but God is inviting them to repentance. Listen to verse 11. And the Lord said to me, faithless Israel has proved herself more righteous than treacherous Judah. Go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, return faithless Israel, declares the Lord. Return, O faithful sons, declares the Lord, for I am a master to you. And I will take you one from a city and two from a family and will bring you to Zion. And God is telling them, listen, I will invite you back. But surely as a woman treacherously departs from her lover, so have you dealt treacherously with me. And so we're opening up the first three chapters with another indictment. Just like Isaiah indicted Israel, Jeremiah is indicting Judah. And now we have our introduction and we can hear more of the solution on tomorrow, which will set us up for Isaiah 29, 11 when you get there. Let's continue to walk through this prophetic book. And I hope you're gaining knowledge so that you may grow in wisdom all the days of your life. You guys take care and have a good day.